So, we are back. Welcome to the Canuckonomicon. I'm Junior. This is the man who shares half my genetic profile. Dirty Clyde. Also my producer, both biologically and <laughs> auditorially. That is correct. <laughs> How much of the biological I had to do with it is yet to be determined. <laughs> oh, I come still on. haven't done my ancestry DNA <laughs> test <laughs> when it comes out with troglodyte. Oh, well, then it'll be obvious. <laughs> that would be so fascinating, though, if I actually ended up being like Lebanese or something. You know, I would not be surprised. Our family tans are real dark. Well, we have that Mediterranean... Yeah. Sort of. Well, and, and we're Ukrainian, part Ukrainian, and that's right near Turkey, so... Well, not that near Turkey. Close enough. We could be gypsies. <laughs> we could. Yep. Yeah. Cossacks. <laughs> Dark Cossacks. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're uh, here for episode seven. Seven, because we finished six on the Nahani Valley. That's right. We did the Nahani Valley number six, which was... Um, and then, uh, so this will be episode seven and rumor has it that something weird is happening with time and space. So we'll find that out later. <laughs> in this episode? Not in this episode. Oh, well, what's, <laughs> what's cool about this episode is it's a bit of a departure from the weird and yeah. more into the historical. Yeah. This one, um, it caught my eye because I did not know that there were any, like, well, first of all, I know very little about the Spanish Civil War in general. I know it happened sometime before World War II, and then Spain seemed to be almost uninvolved in the Second World War. They were just kind of off doing their own thing. Yeah. Um, and I kind of brought up that in my research, I'd kind of found out there were Canadians involved in the Spanish Civil War. And your initial response was, well, by Canadian, I'm assuming you meant American, because there was lots of the American expats. Yeah, well, guys like Hemingway and that, they thought they'd uh, prove their salt by going over and fighting a, a just war. A just war, yeah. Um, well, turns out, there were so many Canadians in the Spanish Civil War that were fighting as members of the Abraham Lincoln uh, Brigade the International Brigade, um, that uh, they formed their own separate battalion within that brigade. Was it a battalion or a unit? It was a, it was a battalion. They were called the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion, or the Mac Paps for short. After the 1837 Rebellionists. Yeah, that's right. And that was their, uh, their battle cry was, the spirit of 1837 <laughs> still lives. A, a dispirited affair. <laughs> 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 the rebellion of 1837. So, um, so let's get into it. Let's just get right into it today. So we're talking about uh, the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion and their uh, how they fought in the Spanish Civil War on the side of the Republicans. So they were part of what was called the 15th International Brigade on the Republican side, um, which was also known as the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. They were formed in July of 1937 because at that time there were around 1,200 Canadians fighting as part of the brigade. It was named in honor of William Lyne Mackenzie, not to be confused with William Lyne Mackenzie King, oh, who's a different guy. Very and different. We're going to talk a bit about him in this episode because, wow, <laughs> awful. <laughs> Would he have been the prime minister at that time? You'll see. It comes up. He, he, he was for a little while, at least. Yeah. Um, and also after um, Louis-Joseph Papineau, uh, who was the... Uh, these were the two leaders of the Upper and Lower Canadian Rebellions. Um, the Upper and Lower Canadian Rebellions, if you're a Canadian, you've probably heard of them. You've also heard that they were absolute disasters. They did not accomplish what they wanted. Um, and it was, it was out of dissatisfaction with the way uh, the Parliament was handling the divide between the French and the English Canadians at that time. Because at that time, the French were living under the English flag. They were no longer part of France. They didn't want to be part of France. That's a common misconception that the French Canadians at this time wanted to be part of France. They didn't. They did want to be part of England, but they wanted to be treated better 
and not as second class citizens. Right. Um, they weren't impressed with the French Revolution. They they wanted a king because they were very Catholic and very much believed in the divine right of kings. But they also wanted their language and religion respected. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, so it's a very complicated affair, but neither rebellion really worked out in anyone's favor. No, I think the uh, uh, lower Canada, that was uh, Ontario? Yeah. Well, what's now Ontario? Yes. Yeah. Was mostly over bread. Yeah. As far as I know, it was like a bar brawl that yeah. took to the streets. Basically, uh, Mc, uh, William Lyon Mackenzie led them. Um, yeah. So the uh, the the battalion was formed 1937. 100 years. Almost exactly 100 years after the uh, 1837 rebellions. Um, it was initially led by an American, uh, Robert G. Thompson, who would go on after the Spanish Civil War to actually fight in the Pacific Theater, um, and came out of World War II as a decorated officer. Um, it, uh, the battalion had its first Canadian commander in November of 1937. Um, now, the MACPAPs were not recognized as veterans. They are not included in the Book of Remembrance. They are not celebrated on Remembrance Day. And there were no monuments built to, to them until 1995 in Toronto. Hmm. When they came home, they were not given veterans dispensation. Many of them were charged with crimes and all of them were investigated by the RCMP as possible communist sympathizers. Right. We'll get more into that a little bit later, but it's kind of strange to think that these people who went to fight on what we now would regard as the right side of the Spanish Civil War against the uh, rebels who were fascists. Franco and the, his... Yeah, under Franco. Um, why would Canada refuse to remember these people? Why would Canada charge them as criminals? Um, and I'm kind of curious, how were the uh, American expats treated after they returned home? Probably much the same way. No, it, it was quite different. I think most of the American expats were writers, mm. uh, artists, um, the left bank folks, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest yeah. Hemingway. These guys were considered um, heroes when they came home, but a different kind of hero. Yeah. Uh, Hemingway, as you remember, also uh, was a war correspondent. So, right. Um, I mean, he participated, I think, uh, to some extent in the Spanish Civil War. But he also was a war correspondent at the same, you know, at the same yeah. time. So, I mean, he had this, the patriotic sense. They were, they were called expats because they left the States to go live in Europe and live that quote unquote bohemian lifestyle. That's right. Um, yeah. In Canada, they got treated very differently on their return home. Um, so while, while this was not officially part of world war two, in many ways, the Spanish civil war was kind of a, a microcosm of what was going to be World War II. It was a rending conflict between ideologies. And this was kind of the war between the two big ideologies. Mm -hmm. So the Republican side um, were democratic, but they were what we would now call democratic socialists. Right. Um, they still, and you have to also remember, this is a war between two royal, two branches of the Spanish royal family. Mm -hmm. Spain still has a king. <laughs> um, and at this time it has two. You have the more, the, the rebel king, and then you have the Republican king. Um, and so you have on the one side, the Republicans, the Democratic Socialists, and then you have Franco and his staunchly anti-socialist, anti-communist um, rebels who are fascists. They are hands down fascists. Um, but fascism was not 
regarded in a negative way at this point in history yet. No. Um, we kind of have the benefit of hindsight, or at least I like to think we do. A mm. lot of the way people are acting across the world right now, I'm starting to think we forgot a lot. Um, but we can look back. We can see what Mussolini did. We can see uh, what kind of a dictator Franco would become. We can see uh, the atrocities committed by Hitler. But at this time, fascism was seen as preferable, mm -hmm. um, if not ideal, when compared to communism and right. socialism. Right. So let's be clear that while we kind of look at fascism as a quote-unquote right-wing uh, government system, it, it's not. Fascism itself is really political, whereas socialism and the right wing, the right left dynamic is really more economic. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of fascist states would actually fall under the left wing because they tend to take a lot of direct control over the economy of the countries that they're in. Mm -hmm. um, they're dictators, they take control over everything. Um, but fascism is really more about the kind of the social dynamic, the protecting of a particular social group right. um, over and above the other social groups. I think we get it more from the sense that uh, we consider it right wing because it tends to look at a smaller majority social group mm -hmm. rather than trying to take into the account of the rights of the entire. But I, I think that kind of leads to us thinking Stalin wasn't fascist. <laughs> Yeah, well, he was dictatorial, that's for darn sure. And he was definitely pro-Russian over mm -hmm. the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. I think I think fa uh, Stalin, in a lot of ways, fits the, the brand of fascist. Because he's looking at the rights and the concerns of his oligarchs and the Russian people over that of the other members of the USSR. R Pure-blood Russians, yes. Yeah. I mean, they had their own... Uh, extermination yeah they almost wiped out the ukraine uh not to mention the jewish populations mm -hmm. and <laughs> uh um orthodox yeah believers, uh, gypsies gypsies and anybody who wasn't a true blood communist mm -hmm. so in a lot of ways they really do fit that kind of fascist idea so while you are this these days um, more likely to come across a radical nationalist authoritarian who has right-wing or libertarian economic philosophies. In history, we do have examples of the opposite. So we have Stalin, um, and we have a number of autocratic kings mm -hmm. who I think would all fall under what we kind of call that kind of radical nationalism, which is what fascism really is. Mm -hmm. Um... And at this time, that radical nationalism was seen pr as preferable to social, to the kind of more global-looking socialism. Right. Um, William Lyon Mackenzie King, and I told you he was going to come up. Uh, he was Prime Minister of Canada at this time, and he wrote uh, uh, about his meeting with Hitler. I then said that I would like to speak once more of the constructive side of his work and what he was seeking to do for the greater good of those in humble walks of life, that I was strongly in accord with it and thought it would work, by which he would be remembered, to let nothing destroy that work, I wished him well in his efforts to help mankind. Hmm. This is what William Lyon Mackenzie right. King and a lot of Canadian politicians felt about fascism and Hitler. <laughs> well, the... You have to remember it, what North Americans saw Yeah, was quite different than what the people living in Germany at the time yeah, saw. Yeah, absolutely. And if you were a normal run-of-the-mill pure-blood German, you didn't even see... Well, and even, even the, a lot of those who didn't, who weren't. Yes. Um, until they came knocking at their doors. That's right. And in fact, even during the, the Second World War, a lot of people were convinced that that horror stories we were hearing about the camps were propaganda. Couldn't have been true. There's no way. They, they couldn't fathom that a human being would do that to his own people. Um, or allow that even. 
mm-hmm. and they couldn't believe that the Germans didn't know about it. And yet, they didn't. And they were. <laughs> um, it, so, like I said, we have the benefit of hindsight. Right. In, in how we judge in how history. We, exactly. Yeah. In, in how we look at fascist ideology nowadays. Um, so, so, the, so the Canadian government looking at these returning... They're seeing what they would call premature anti-fascists. Right. And it wasn't popular to be an anti-fascist yet. No. And I would say in a lot of ways it's not now either. I would say it's about 50-50. Mm-hmm. About 50% of the population in, in North America would be totally fine with you as identifying as anti-fascist. Mm-hmm. And another 50% are going to consider you, in very much the same way as they did back then, a radical socialist communist. Well, we do like to group one another, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. And so you can't... There's this mindset now that you can't be an anti-fascist unless you're a radical leftist. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you just don't want us to fall into the same trap that we did back in World War II, mm. <laughs> which is where I stand. I don't want us to fall into that. I would not call myself a radical leftist. No. <laughs> no, and I'm definitely what, I, what, what you would define as a centrist. And, uh, you know, but <laughs> I, see, I see the dangers of the Cold War. Yeah. I see the dangers of extreme fascism and I kind of think you know can't can't there be a middle ground yeah and for many years Canada represented that middle ground yeah and now it's trying to go one way or the other it's there's there's the the political climate right now is not allowing for middle grounds yeah it's so polarized it's very polarized yeah um According to uh, Briar Patch Magazine, it was only a month later that Mackenzie King, the Mackenzie King government, would pass uh, a law after stating this this about Hitler, um, that would make it illegal to offer any assistance, ostensibly to either side of the Spanish Civil War, and this includes humanitarian aid. Uh, they weren't allowing medical teams to go over either. Um, it's notable that almost no Canadians were signing up to go fight for the rebels. Mm-hmm. It was, they were almost all signing up to go fight for the Republicans. Um, so it then became illegal to do so. Um, a few Canadians had foresight. Uh, a lot of them had uh, communist leanings. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a result, they saw themselves as being anti-fascist long before it was cool. And by the end of the Spanish Civil War, many of the MacPaps were finding themselves being prosecuted for joining in the fight, um, as per the Foreign Enlistment Act. This would last until January of 1939, when it was decided that they would be allowed to return home. While some managed to fight in World War II, a lot were actually barred from enlisting in World War II, as they were considered politically suspect. Oh, really? Yeah, for being premature anti-fascist. That was the label that was being thrown around a lot in North America, across <laughs> North America. It was, a, it was an American term. Because you beat us to the punch, we're not letting you fight in this one. Yeah. <laughs> and they basically said, well, you're... It, it was another way of saying you're a communist. Yes, we're questioning your motives. Yeah. Um... Yeah, in other words, if you fought against fascism before fighting broke out with Germany, the governments of North America said you're a communist. Right. (laughs) In fairness to the Canadian government at that time, most of the MacPaps were communist. Members of the Communist Party of Canada. Yeah, and that was as a result of the Foreign Enlistment Act. Okay. Before the Foreign Enlistment Act... Lots of Canadians are going over to fight against the rebels. They consider the Spanish Republicans to be allies. They were dem- democratic. Right. The Franco government was not. <laughs> right. Um, after the Foreign Enlistment Act, only the Communist Party of Canada were really the only ones still wanting to enlist, still willing to take that risk to send soldiers over there um, to support this kind of red-leaning democratic socialist government. Right. 
Um, and they took steps to make sure that the people they were enlisting weren't just the Hemingways and the adventurers and stuff, mm-hmm. that, and they weren't fleeing family problems, that they were true believer communists. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of the people who would end up fighting in the Spanish Civil War on, under the uh, Mackenzie Papineau uh, Battalion were communists. Uh, one of the most famous Mac Paps was Norman Bethune, who was a Canadian adventurer, thoracic surgeon, and communist sympathizer. He is notable because he actually invented the Mobile Battlefield Blood Transfusion Unit. Mm-hmm. It was a humanitarian device designed primarily to save the lives of soldiers. Um, the Foreign Enlistment Act had a special clause inserted in it to prevent this specific device from even being used in the okay. Spanish Civil War, uh, he still brought it over. There, at this time, there were over, almost 1,600 Canadians in the battalion. Mm-hmm. Um, Norman Bethune used this battle or this war to actually pioneer his mobile blood transfusion unit. Um, he had originally gone over to assist with a Canadian-funded hospital unit that had been built over there. But he wanted to be closer to the front lines, and so he thought this was his opportunity to try out this, yeah. basically, this battlefield ambulance to go out there and, and give blood transfusions. Um, and I will say this, I'm probably going to do an episode on Bethune. You'd have to, because he was involved in uh, Mao's um, Yeah, he was in rebellion all well. sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was a veteran of World War I. He had survived a shrapnel injury. He had been cured of tuberculosis by undergoing an experimental surgery where they collapsed his infected lung. Hmm. Um, he was eulogized by, by Mao Zedong when Bethune died from blood poisoning, assisting the Chinese communist rebels with blood transfusions in their own war. Um, his presence against Franco was initially seen as a symbolic boost and victory for the Republican Span- Spanish. Spanish. Um, Michael Petru, one of the uh, other veterans of this war, or sorry, not he wasn't a veteran, he was a writer. Uh, he says in his book, Renegades, um, which is kind of one of the major works concerning the Canadian troops in the Spanish Civil War, Bethune was a tangible example of international solidarity with the beleaguered Spaniards, especially during the Siege of Madrid. In the fall of 1936, the fascists have been unstoppable. They are at the gates of Madrid. The workers have armed themselves. They've thrown up these banners that read, No Pasaran, they shall not pass. And there's Bethune, this foreigner, in the middle of this maelstrom, giving Spaniards a way to help people at the front. The act of giving blood is symbolically powerful. Hmm. He's that, Gandalf. Yeah. That was a, shall not pass. And I almost wonder if that, if that isn't where he gets that line. Uh, I wonder. Tolkien, because yeah. he, he was all round at this time. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, and it's a powerful line. And it's fascinating, this idea of this kind of uh, Canadian adventure. This is not a, the sort of figure we're familiar with a lot in Canada. Mm-hmm. We don't have a lot of figures like Bethune, um, but we have this guy. <laughs> and yeah. yeah. What, what a figure he is. And I, I think he's worthy of a whole episode on his own. own. Um, Bethune wasn't loved by the Spanish brass, but he was loved in a way by a Swedish journalist named... Kasia Rotham, who many believed was a fascist spy. <laughs> um, Alexander A. McLeod was, as a result, sent as part of a Canadian mission to retrieve Bethune from the front lines and get him out of Spain. <laughs> um, he, Bethune was uh, egotistical, <laughs> and he tended to rub the leadership of the Spanish really just in all the wrong ways. <laughs> And apparently, this Cassia lady, he rubbed her in all the right ways. Yeah, uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, why don't we take a quick break there, and then I'll tell you a bit about uh, Alexander McLeod. You bet.
All right, so let's talk about Alexander A. McLeod. Uh, McLeod was born in 1902 in Black Rock, Nova Scotia. He, like his father, worked in the steel mill at the Sydney Mines, making him, unlike Bethune, one of the working class men who went over to fight. So there was a, actually quite a divide of different strata of so you'd have your intelligentsia, yeah, exactly. you'd have your soldier kind of people, and then you'd have your working class. Well, almost it was entirely intelligentsia and working class. Okay. There was really very little middle class right. people fighting here. Um, you kind of have these, these sort of, uh, you might call them intellectual socialists. Mm-hmm. You know, like the university communists and stuff. Guys like Bethune, who would have yeah. had a, an altruistic motive for, yeah. for going. And then you have these union guys. Right. A lot of these union guys are going over because they they want to fight for the working man. And they don't see Franco as being for the working man in Spain. They see him as an enemy of socialism, which for them was for the working man. Very unlike nowadays. Right. <laughs> um... So, It'd be interesting to look at unemployment rates and see how many were unemployed. <laughs> yeah. Because don't don't forget, this is like... Just after the just Depression. The, the Great Depression. So, yeah. you know, recovery probably isn't complete. A lot of them are not skilled. A lot of yeah. them, you know... So to do something like this actually gives you a sense of self-worth. Well, and, and Alexander McLeod's story is, is very fascinating because... While he is working class, he's born and raised working class, he actually gets around in some pretty high up circles. Okay. Um, Alexander's, like I said, he worked at the, the steel mills in the Sydney mines. Um, he fought in World War I as a member of the 185th Battalion of Cape Breton Highlanders. And according to the September 30th, 1937 issue of the Leader Post in Regina, he is believed to actually have been one of the youngest, or the youngest soldier who enlisted in World War I. Okay. Um, he moved to New York in the 1920s, and uh, when he was there, he worked for a socialist newspaper and met his wife. This is believed to have been uh, the beginning of his radicalization into the kind of the far-left communist party. Um... Yeah, and this was after his involvement in the defense for the Scottsboro boy, the Scottsboro boys. Um, the Scottsboro boys were uh, two African American men who had been falsely accused of raping a white woman. And without getting deep into specifics, the Communist Party of the United States became heavily involved in their legal defense, um, and McLeod was directly involved with it. Um, and uh, after this, in 1933, McLeod uh, took his family and they moved back to Nova Scotia and worked in an election for the leader of the Workers United Front. McLeod hmm. um, was actually one of the organizers of the Canadian League Against War and Fascism, um, presiding as chairman of the organization from 1934 to 1939. Um, the Canadian League Against War and Fascism was one of the main kind of groups that was involved in getting soldiers from Canada to Spain to fight okay. in the Spanish Civil War. Um, and he resigned his position just as World War II broke out. He was also one of the organizers for the Canadian Committee to Aid Spanish Democracy and was one of the men who fought for the formation of the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion as a separate battalion uh, within the larger Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Okay. Um, McLeod met up with Bethune and sent him home. Uh, he basically convinced Bethune to leave Spain because Bethune had this idea to build uh, children's hospitals uh, across Spain to mm -hmm. help the displaced and orphan children of the war. Um, and uh, McLeod liked the idea, but also knew that Bethune had to get out of Spain. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. we can't keep him here anymore. So he basically said, you're going to go on a speaking tour of Canada no. <laughs> and drum up support. Um, and uh, Bethune took him up on that. Um, so what Bethune did is as he was making his way out of Spain, he visited a number of the children's colonies and hospitals that were already there. And he actually gathered up 
drawings that the kids had made. And he took these back home with him to Canada and actually distributed them out to as propaganda. And it was one of the most effective pieces of propaganda that had come out of the war. I've actually uh, had, uh, I went online, if you go to SpanishCivilWar.ca, you can actually read a lot of the pamphlets and magazines that were actually being handed out by the Communist Party of Canada to uh, drum up support. And they had one that was uh, specifically letters from the front lines mm -hmm. of these soldiers. And I was reading through them, and it, it's fascinating. It's a lot of... These guys are basically just asking for newspaper, cigarettes, and chocolate. Mm -hmm. That's like, all they want. Like any soldier. <laughs> yeah. There was... There was it's, it's very strange. There's no communist stuff in there except for like a few ads for like starting youth groups right little communist youth groups to get kids involved in supporting the spanish civil war it, it's very very fascinating um but these drawings on the other hand uh they're still in the ottawa archives by the way you can actually find them over there um the mac paps with these drawings actually managed to uh get a whole bunch more support from across the political strata. Uh, not just from the communists and the far left, but from a lot more centrist and even a few right-wing people started to... Well, sure, through the hearts of... You, you appeal to people's hearts for children. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Um, and it, they, he, they were also aided by the bombing of Guernica right. in 1937. Uh, Hitler's Condor unit bombed Guernica, killing hundreds of civilians. Um, having heard of this, started to kind of legitimize the fight that the Canadians were making uh, against the Spanish fascists, because the fascists had allied themselves with somebody who was willing to bomb civilians to win, right. which is just not seen as good. <laughs> yeah, that was bad sportsmanship. Yeah. Um... And this led to a, a lot more support um, being sent to the to the Mac Paps unofficially. Mm -hmm. Still not officially. By the end of the war, um, 721 of the 1,546 Mac Paps who fought in Spain had lost their lives defending the Spanish against the predations of the fascist rebels. Spanish Prime Minister Negrin ordered the international brigades withdrawn from the defense of Madrid and honorably discharged them on September 21st, 1938. The Mac Paps, though, had a very difficult time returning home. Those who did make it home, the Canadian government wanted nothing to do with. Um, many of them found themselves facing criminal charges for breaking the Foreign Enlistment Act, and it wouldn't be until January of 1939 when it was finally decided that the Mac Paps would officially be allowed to return home to Canada. After which they were investigated by the RCMP. Many were refused jobs and profitable employment and were all labeled as premature anti-fascists. Hmm. They had sacrificed their lives and livelihoods to defend against a tyrannical government but ultimately lost the battle and returned home disgraced. The fascist regime would remain in place until 1975, surviving almost every other fascist dictatorship in Europe, with the exception of maybe the USSR, if you're willing to stretch the definition of fascism the way I am. Right. Um, so why did these brave Canadians go over there? Some, For some, it was certainly a belief in socialism and communism, but for others... We will look at an interview that was done. Uh, so there's a collection of interviews, by the way. I didn't mention this. In the 1960s, um, a reporter actually interviewed a number of the surviving members of the Mac Paps. We have a, a fellow in particular named Paivio, uh, who in 1965 was interviewed. These were uh, recorded by the CBC, but never released until a <laughs> documentary was done in 2015. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they think that it was basically, uh, we were in the midst of the Cold War, 
and a right. lot of these guys were communists and yeah. the in the reporter who interviewed them was known to be a communist sympathizer. Um, Paivio said in 1965, the main thing was a terrible fear of fascism taking over. I didn't expect to come back, but it seemed a worthwhile thing to do. So there you go, guys. That was the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion. Um, a shorter episode, but we have some other things we want to do. We're getting geared up for a busy month next month. Um, you can find us on Twitter, at the Canuckonomicon. Uh, we're on iTunes. We're on Google Play now, though I can't seem to find us. I know we're on there. Well, And I know we're on SoundCloud, but I've only seen episode one. Yeah, I'm I'm over my limit on that oh, episode. Just with the one episode. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, that makes sense. You know, you get, like, <laughs> I, I pay for a SoundCloud account, and yeah. you only get 237 minutes. Mm-hmm. It's dumb. But. So, just so, so, sort of, I, I know, um, it's, it's sort of interrupting the, the, the flow here, but. Yeah. Um, a lot of the reasons that these Mac Paps went over were exactly the same reasons that Canadian uh, Canadians enlisted uh, to, to fight Hitler. Yeah. And, I mean, considering so many of them were um, veterans of the First World War. Yeah. Uh, the, their motives should, should not be questioned. No. I mean, it, it seems <laughs> it's, so... It, and it's because... Because it, it conflicted with the ideology of the moment. That's right. Even though that ideology matched perfectly. Yeah. And, and it, it's, it's... I think it goes back to that whole idea of appeasement that was really popular in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, appeasing Hitler. Hitler. Just, just let him walk into... You know, a lot of people felt like the reparations of the First World War were so um, skewed against the losing side, and they were like, and and they were like, yeah, but because uh, they had to, they had to pay for the whole war, yeah, and, and they, there was no way they were ever going to have enough money to do that. But and, but yeah. Hitler did bring them back from that brink, yeah, and uh, you know that is what people saw. They, yeah. saw, they saw the strength of, of that movement, and I think we're reluctant to paint it with an evil brush. Yeah, and I, I, I the thing is that I think it was a very similar thing in Spain. A, a fear of angering what could be the winning side. Yeah. We want Spain to be our ally after this. We're not going to pay attention to what that guy's like. Mm -hmm. We're just going to let him do his thing. And we're just going to ignore it, and uh, we'll back the winner. Yeah. And I think it was pretty clear the Republicans were going to lose. They just, they didn't have the, the numbers or the allies or, or the, the infrastructure or the infrastructure to yeah. win. Um, which is, you kind of wonder if the Americans had sent over an official international brigade mm -hmm. to fight and not just volunteers which there was no way they were gonna do not not at all no uh they <laughs> barely got into the second world war if it weren't for pearl harbor they wouldn't be uh wouldn't have been there yeah not no exactly and i mean well because they were still operating under isol isolationism which hey doesn't that line up well with fascism as well yeah yeah <laughs> right like and that's the thing is that nationalism was considered good at this time mm -hmm. uh it, it's funny we, yeah and it was a liberal who ultimately wanted to get us weapons mm -hmm. a lot of people say it was Diefenbaker it went before Diefenbaker it was uh Leslie uh Leslie, Lester Pearson Lester Pearson who ordered nuclear weapons the, for the Canada. same man who uh, was uh, one of the originators of the United Nations yeah <laughs> and 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 um, the he actually was in England, uh, in the war office there when the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and his mm -hmm. kids said it was the only thing about that war he never talked about mm -hmm. was what it was like to hear that. Mm -hmm. He never talked about it, which tells me I think he was scared, and I think he felt the only way to actually protect Canada was to arm Canada. Yeah. 
and and that whole mutually assured destruction mindset. Yeah. Which is just insane. <laughs> That's an insane well, idea. <laughs> it, it was effective. Barely. <laughs> It was barely effective, but it was... It, and, uh, and, and we have a, a, a low-ranking communist soldier in a freaking submarine to thank for that not happening. Yes. <laughs> for refusing to push the button. For refusing to push the button. Yeah. Like... Wow. <laughs> just nuts. In, in, insane. So, uh, guys, um, keep, your, keep your eyes open out there. Be safe. And uh, punch a Nazi. <laughs> right in the baby maker. Pow! <laughs> uh, until next time, it's Dirty Clyde. And I'm Junior. We'll see you next time.